So really weird animals have existed in our planet's history, many of which I've spoken about on my channel before. And I really think when it comes to mammals, one animal that is really up there in terms of just weirdness is the gorilla, giraffe, camel, sloth, hybrid, the Calicotherium. Nijin was a strange time. This was the point in which mammals had, for the first time, gained true dominance in worldwide ecosystems and established themselves as the main form of megafauna on the planet. Because of this evolutionary explosion, as what tends to be the case after many niches are left vacant for a group to fill, this group got pretty experimental in terms of morphology to occupy said niches, and not many showed this better than the Calicothers. Remains of this weirdo was first sent to famous naturalist George Cuvier when he assigned the claw to some sort of giant pangolin, but it wasn't until nearly a hundred years later that a nearly complete skeleton was recovered from a quarry in Germany, being fully described by Johann Jacob Kaup in 1833 as Calicotherium goldfussiae, meaning pebble beast. Calicotherium was also crowned as the type genus for a new family, the Calicotheridae. It was a fairly typical member of this group too. Calicotheres in general were part of a group known as Perissodactyls, the order of hoof mammals which bear their weight on an odd amount of toes, including equids, rhinos and tapirs. And it might seem a little strange me saying that considering how far removed from its relatives it seems at a glance. Working from the head down, Calicotherium had a very horse-like head, showcasing a long snout, dexterous lips and a long and muscular neck. Going further down the torso was very bulky and robust, being roughly proportionate to the head to the same degree as a horse, as well as likely having a classic herbivore gut. So far it seems like a giant horse. And then we get to the limbs. The hind limbs of Calicotherium were very robust, but also very short, with fossilized footprints showing that these were possibly plantigrade, which is when the entire foot supports the animal as opposed to just the ball of the foot. Though it's highly possible that Calicotheres had a hybrid of the two, resting and standing in a plantigrade stance and walking in a digitigrade posture. What seems even weirder is the front limbs. These were extremely long, supporting the animal whilst walking but also having enough dexterity to use in foraging, likely being used to reach up trees for high browsing. The most standout feature as an undulate though is that these front limbs were heavily clawed, now we'll get back to the function of these claws soon enough, but it's these claws that gave Calicotherium such a strange posture, especially for an undulate. Animals employ various techniques to keep their claws in tip-top shape without wearing them down. This can be adopting retractable claws like cats, adopting a bipedal posture like theropods, or the approach that the Calicotheres took, walking on their knuckles like an ape. Bone calluses and the phalanges of all calicotheres show that this is how they were getting around, keeping their three claws tucked away safely whilst also supporting the bulk on all four limbs. Speaking of bulk, let's talk size. Calicotherium stood at around 8 to 10 feet tall at the shoulder and weighed up to 1,000 kilograms or just over 2,200 pounds, competing for first place as the biggest of the group of the similarly estimated size of Moropus. Now this doesn't make Calicotherium immune to predation as a fully grown adult like some sauropods, but it's a formidable enough size to make any predator be extra careful. Speaking of predators, let's take a look at this guy's environment. Now many specimens that were originally assigned to Calicotherium have been found all over the place, but only two valid species of Calicotherium as of the time of recording this have been found in Europe and China from strata dating to the mid to late Miocene between 15.97 to 15.33 million years ago. As stated during my Neogene video, the Miocene was a time in which Earth was beginning to cool, foreshadowing the impending ice age of the Pleistocene. Eurasia in particular experienced heavy aridification during this time, with extensive steppe vegetation and grasslands becoming abundant. This was seen the most in the Asian parts of Eurasia, but more temperate forests could be seen as one travelled west into what is now Europe. Given this vast expanse and habitat variability, Calicotherium shared its environment with a lot of diverse types of fauna, 
Included here mainly were fellow undulates, of which showed a massive boom during the Miocene. Some undulates had already nooked out of land and were already taken to the water. The main example being whales, of which I did an unintentionally controversial video about here. Read the comments on that for more. Outside of that one weird example though were primitive deer, antelope and giraffes, along the famous Paraceratherium that I've talked about here. Carnivores of the region show primitive saber-toothed cats, amphicyonids or bear dogs, and hyenodonts, all of which are thought to have possibly fed on Calicotherium. The group as a whole wasn't just limited to Eurasia though, with Calicotheres first popping up here around 46 million years ago but raiding out to the Americas and Africa too. Question is, how was such a weird animal living in this environment? Toothwear patterns on relatives of Calicotherium show that these guys' favourite foods were in fact leaves and fruits, meaning that those long mobile arms were likely used primarily for reaching up and pulling down branches within reach of its tongue. Calicotherium actually lacked incisors, meaning it would probably have to put the whole twig into its mouth using the dexterous lips and tongue before stripping the twig of what it wanted. Paleontologists also think that it would have spent a very long time doing this, actually being evolved and specialised for laziness. Those hind limbs were especially short for good reason, in conjunction with a long pelvis that angled slightly downward and showed calluses. Essentially, Calicotherium was a very efficient sitter, which I'm sure I can say is a very special skill in a job interview and could spend most of its day sitting whilst feeding, since in this position most of the animal's length was still being utilised. But despite the very efficient laziness, Calicotheres aren't around anymore, so something must have gone wrong for them. Well, the main downfall here was the fact that they were specialised for high browsing, and it was during this time that grasslands, steppes and prairies increased substantially, and natural deforestation became prevalent especially in Eurasia. Again, calicotheres were built for sitting and reaching, not covering ground, so their relative undulates such as primitive horses were a lot more equipped for this new environment, meaning that the calicotheres numbers dwindled. What's also thought to be a potential nail in the coffin for this strange group, especially in the Americas, is what is known as the Great American Interchange. This is an event that I've spoken about a couple of times before, but it's essentially when North and South America finally joined at modern day Panama, forming a land bridge and ending South America's isolation. As the megafauna from both sides crossed paths, fierce competition brought an end to many groups, from terabars to giant sloths, as well as any American calicotheres, due to facing competition from much more dexterous and mobile apes that were feeding from the trees. So the thing that couldn't decide if it was a horse or an ape got out-competed by horses and apes. If you can do something, go hard. Which brings us into today's question, which comes from Mason Harkness 6437 who has asked, Hey Ryan, when the debate arises of apex or large carnivorous dinosaurs being social creatures, or at least displaying pack hunting behaviour, most people never seem to make the comparison or look at modern apex predators' behaviours such as lions, wolves, bears or even orcas. Is that because they're simply mammals and their cognitive functions slash abilities are just too different to compare with reptiles such as dinosaurs? Okay, that's a good one. Uh, it's kind of a yes and no here. Now there are absolutely cognitive differences between dinosaurs and mammals, not necessarily making one smarter than the other, but certainly showing different types of intelligence with any similarities being convergent. The problem here is that the closest reference point we've got is avian dinosaurs, i.e. birds, and as far as I'm aware, they do not show pack hunting behaviour. But it might be erroneous to use that fact to assume that the extinct non-avian groups also didn't hunt in packs, because dinosaurs are a hell of a lot more diverse than just what birds show. Organised pack hunting is one of the best signs for social intelligence in animals, and mammals are the best extinct example that showcase this. 
So making comparisons between the two isn't done all that much simply because yes, the cognitive abilities do show different specialities in extinct descendants, but that doesn't mean that it should be written off entirely. Pack hunting is thought to have occurred within non-avian dinosauria at some point. So it stands to perfect reason that brain functions were convergently similar to modern mammalian predators who hunt in packs. Plus, birds do show social intelligence to a high degree. It's just that this isn't exercised in social hunting at this point in time. Basically, mammalian comparisons aren't made as often just because of the conversion and speculative nature of it. It's considered a lot more conjectural than the bird comparisons. Anyway, thank you for submitting the question, and if you have a question, please make sure that you are subscribed so that you can submit a question when the window opens. You need to keep an eye out for the community posts because I'm not taking questions in the video comments, just because I want to get everyone answered, and down there, they'll just get lost. Alternatively, you can get first dibs on your question being answered at any time as one of the many perks you get as a patron, so I'll leave a link below. And thank you to everyone else who's watched this far because it really does do wonders in helping me out. And I'll catch you guys next time.